Welcome to the first lecture of Unit 5. This is um, on the Iron Horse, or trains after the Civil War. Um, our target is 5.01. It's kind of hard for many of us to look at trains the same way that 19th century Americans did. For us, the car symbolizes our world, our ability to move around anywhere we want. Trains were the symbol of the age for the 19th century. Uh, the design of the train, the speed of the train, what the train could do spoke of human ingenuity. It spoke of progress. It spoke of the power of the American spirit to conquer the landscape. To, to annihilate distance, as it were, to ship people across the United States, to ship goods across the United States, was all a part of the train's mystique and its power in the 19th century. So let's start by looking at uh, the, the effects of train on the train on American life. First of all, after the Civil War, trains are used to link the East and the West as a transcontinental line is built in the United States. And by 1893, there'll be five tra transcontinental lines. So it seems that the, the distance in America has shrunk considerably as the East and the West are linked by trains after the Civil War. Trains also increase industrial production in the United States. If you want to make products, that's great, but moving them from place to place is an important part of being an industry. Of course, it's also an important part of being in, ag in agriculture as well. So trains are really the first big business after the Civil War, and they spur other businesses, steel, lumber, the transportation of any good or service is going to take off dramatically because of trains. Trains are going to promote trade. As railroads are laid down, the tracks are laid down through the West and across America and small towns, those towns will grow. Towns closer to railroads see lots of growth. In Columbus, for example, um, the trains came in at uh, where the convention center is located now, just before you get to the short north. Um, that was the original Union Station just north of town. But all along the railroad, um, you see people um, building homes, building businesses to take advantage of uh, being able to put goods on a railroad um, on a train and ship them across the United States. Because trains link the East and the West, they help with the settlement of the West. It's a lot easier to go West if you can just get on a train and get, get there rather than doing wagon and horseback and walking. So the increased transportation um, ability of movement of people and goods allows for the effective settlement of Western lands beyond the Mississippi River. And people out there not only are farming, but they begin another boom, which um, is still important even today, and that's the cattle boom. The West becomes a place for um, raising large herds of cattle um, for America's growing hunger for meat. And this cattle frontier in Texas and the rest of the West um, needs a way of getting uh, the cows to market. Can't get your steak if you can't get it 
um, quickly. So laying out railroads to the west also helped create this new industry, this new uh, production, um, increased production of meat. If you look at all of these effects, for us, they seem almost invisible today because we just don't think about railroads as much. We don't think about transportation via railroads. Hardly any of us ride on trains anywhere. But for people of the 19th century, the railroad was incredibly transformative as it linked America, as it spurred industrial production, promoted trade, helped settle the West, and built this cattle frontier in the West. So we shouldn't um, underestimate just how impactful railroads were. In an age when uh, people couldn't travel by car, it was either you know, on foot or via horse or on a boat, the train linking Chicago and Kansas City and St. Louis um, provided Americans with the way to move uh, themselves as well as you know, goods and services across the United States. And they could do so in style. You see, she's relaxed in this chair. Actually, this chair does not look very comfortable to me. Um, and apparently, you know, you relax with some flowers in your hand because, you know, that's just what you do. Um, here's an actual interior of one of these fancy uh, people transporting trains, passenger trains. Um, and you can see you've got nice little fringe chairs and couches for people to travel in luxury as they move around America and see the sights. One of the things that we should also take into account is if trains were able to create this vast economic growth in America, they had to be very powerful. Um, the, the men who owned these railroads and the railroad lines had to be very wealthy men. And in fact, railroads became the first big business in America and generated enormous economic uh, power as well as political power for owners of the railroads. For one thing, um, as this first bullet point points out, railroad companies own vast tracts of Western land. Um, the first transcontinental railroad was finished in 1869 using land given by the federal government. The federal government handed over this land so that this transcontinental line could be built. Railroads with control over vast tracts of land, therefore have control over where the lines go, have control over you know, who has access to those lines depending on where you build. Um, and of course, they can sell extra lands that they decide they no longer need. Um, owning property generates wealth. Railroads are so powerful in the 19th century that they actually change time itself. Ooh, that sounds really dramatic, doesn't it? So what I actually mean here is that in 1883, railroads actually got together and adopted standard time zones. And they did it because you needed to be able to know when the train was coming. Um, if everybody in every small town sets time their way, according to what they think is right in that small town, according to where the sun is, then the railroads uh, stops are not going to line up uh, time-wise. And then nobody will be able to know when the train's coming. So they need a standard system of knowing what time it's going to be. And the railroads are the ones who then create the time zones in 1883. Congress will adopt an official time zones in 1918, much later than the railroads do. The railroads are also so powerful in the 19th century that they are able to trigger some economic panics. And I want you to think about why that is. If a railroad is 
so powerful in terms of its control over industry and the buying and selling and shipping of goods, then it stands to reason railroads could put people out of business if they wanted to. Or if a railroad itself went out of business, think about all the people dependent on it being hurt by that. And so railroads do, uh, in the 19th century, cause some economic panics, especially when the railroads themselves um, engage in shady or illegal, uh, unethical business practices, um, when they engage in business practices that lead to bankruptcy. Think about all the people that hurts who depend on that railroad to ship goods or on that railroad for a job. Um, in 1873, for example, there is a panic um, partially caused uh, when a railroad goes bankrupt. We'll see the same thing in 1890. Here's a map showing land grants to railroads in the West. Um, you can see pretty much it looks like all of Iowa is one giant land grant. Um, nearly all of Minnesota too. Um, these lands were reserved for grants uh, for the railroads. Um, the railroads then used um, the darker purple areas for their actual railroad operations. The rest they could, uh, they could sell. Um, these yellow spots are areas where the railroads forfeited the land. They gave it up. They no longer needed it. Um, this map is 1871 and shows actually at this point in 1871, there are actually two uh, ways to get across um, the West. You can see the Northern Pacific Line, and then you can see the Central Pacific uh, Line. This is the first transcontinental railroad here, this middle one. There will be a Southern one as well. Um, by 1893, we'll be able to go across the United States in several different directions. When the first transcontinental line was uh, opened in 1869, Promontory Point, Utah, um, they took a photograph. This is a colorized version of that photograph showing the two trains meeting. That's because they built the railroad from the west coast and from the east and met in the middle. It was almost like a race to, uh, to see who could get there first. Um, so they met in the middle and you can see the guys at the in the middle there are having a, a little champagne toast um, and celebrating all of this work. Um, a lot of guys in fancy suits, but the reality is the building of this transcontinental line was done by Irish and Chinese workers um, in very brutal and harsh conditions. Um, lots of workers died in, um, in accidents um, some Chinese workers, for example, were buried um, in a landslide and uh, covered in snow, and the railroad didn't even bother to dig them out. Um, some of their bodies appeared the next spring when the snow melted um, and exposed them. So uh, this looks celebratory, but we have to always remember the reality behind events like this um, and who did that actual work to make this happen. Um, here is an illustration of the railroad's control over time, showing you when they depart, when they arrive, and uh, the railroads decided the best way to do that is for them to standardize time. So you didn't have a different time in every town that never matched up. And here's a cartoon illustrating the power of the railroads. Um, this is something that's kind of invisible to us today, except if you're a fan of the game of Monopoly. You may have wondered on the Monopoly board why there are railroads there. That just seems weird for us to buy and sell railroads. But in the 19th century, um, buying and selling railroads and gaining control over railroad lines was a huge business. And it was a very competitive business. Uh, for example, here you can see Jim Fisk competing with Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt. 
Vanderbilt is the, the king of railroads in this time period. He's one of America's earliest wealthy robber barons. Um, absolutely ruthless and um, really a mean-spirited man when you read a lot about him. Um, highly competitive. It was almost like a game for them to try to outmaneuver each other and see who could get control um, over the railroads and therefore be the king of the railroads. And that spirit is why it ended up being in Monopoly. Here's another cartoon of uh, William Henry Vanderbilt, um, Vanderbilt uh, child, uh, son of Cornelius, who uh, went on to emulate his father. And at one point when a reporter was interviewing him about um, the way he was treating the public, um, he said, the public be damned. He just didn't care. Railroads were so powerful that they began to arouse criticism from Americans. Um, the railroads did a lot of things that Americans found unacceptable and downright corrupt. So let's take a look at some of the complaints that Americans lodged against these railroad companies um, in the 19th century. One of the ones you hear in the West is um, that the railroads won't sell extra land to settlers, um, or if they sell, they sell at high prices. Sometimes you hear settlers complain uh, that the railroad's not selling the best lands. Um, the Westerners in particular have a deep dislike of railroads. They need them to get west. They need them to ship their products from the west. At the same time, they hate being dependent on these large railroad companies. And so uh, a lot of their complaints out west have to do with uh, how the railroads control and dominate the landscape. You hear um, from many folks in the 19th century that railroads charge different rates to different customers. They work out deals to help some people, but not others. So they're playing favorites. Um, they're not treating everyone equally. So maybe if you work out some kind of deal with Cornelius Vanderbilt, you'll get a rate discount. But just ordinary Joe Schmo customer guy won't get the same kind of treatment. You hear from a lot of folks in the 19th century uh, that the railroads charge excessively high rates. Sometimes the rates are so high that people are put out of business. Especially Western farmers say this. Um, they have no choice but to use the railroads to ship their farm goods. And if they don't, those goods will go to waste. The corn will rot. Your meat will go bad. You can't um, just hold on to it for another year because uh, you need to get it to market. And so you're gonna have to pay what the railroad says or just lose everything. And finally, one of the things that is frequently said about railroads in the 19th century is that they are insanely corrupt and corrupt politicians as a result. There are several scandals involving the railroads bribing politicians with stock, getting politicians to use their influence to pass laws favorable to railroads. And this um, corruption of the political system is widely seen um, as one of the most dangerous aspects of the railroads in the 19th century. Uh, because it threatens to undermine law and order as the railroads are able to buy off and get what they want, buy off people, get what they want. Um, we'll talk more about this corruption of the political system when we talk more about robber barons in an upcoming lecture. Uh, but remember, the first robber barons are really the owners of railroads, and so they start uh, these trends. Here's a cartoon um, 
criticizing the railroads, showing them as this giant monster stepping on people you can see down here, um, using its power, its money, capital, to bludgeon its um, enemies. A policeman is, you know, whistling to stop, but the railroad doesn't care because the railroad has what's called judicial ermine or really the support of the courts to get what it wants. So starting in the 1870s, a lot of Americans asked themselves, what can they do to fix these abuses? How can Americans stop the railroads from stomping all over Americans and making life difficult for them? Uh, one of the first attempts to do this is through a series of what are called Granger Laws in the 1870s. These were laws in several states designed to limit the power of the railroads, to regulate the railroads, to force the railroads to behave. And it sounds like a really good idea. Let's go all get together in Illinois, for example, and we're going to pass a law to limit that railroad in Illinois. Good. Now that railroad will behave, except there's a problem. Railroads don't just exist inside of a state. By its design, a railroad is supposed to cross state lines. That's how you ship goods and services everywhere you need to go. So it didn't really work um, to just limit and punish a railroad inside a state when a railroad crossed over into another state. And in fact, that triggered a series of Supreme Court cases, um, the first one being Munn v. Illinois, 1877, when the Supreme Court said that a state can regulate a railroad inside that state. So if you have a railroad inside of Ohio, or Illinois in this case, it can be regulated inside of the state. But what happens when the railroad crosses a state line and moves on into another state? Well, we get a second case. And that second case helps launch something called the Interstate Commerce Act. Americans realize that if you want to control a railroad that crosses a state line, you need a law to regulate railroads across America and not just in Illinois. And that's what the Interstate Commerce Act will do. The federal government can supervise railroads under the Interstate Commerce Act because those railroads cross state lines. This is a constitutional power of our U.S. government, our federal government. So when the railroads move across state lines, that's when the federal government steps in. This act, unfortunately, was not strongly enforced. And because it was not strongly enforced, the railroads could continue to get away with abusing the American public. So even though there are Supreme Court cases and an Interstate Commerce Act, the railroads still are able to get away with abusing people and abusing their power and will continue to do so until 1908. But that's a story for another day.